Hi everyone, welcome to the next video in the next unit in SI 335. This is all about sorting, but I want to emphasize that I have these units organized around different problems like sorting and later we'll look at multiplication, we'll look at graph problems and some other things, but it's not really about that problem. That's kind of a medium for us to really talk about um, ideas. So specifically design and analysis ideas. What can we do when we come across a new problem and we want to des design a great algorithm for it? What do we want to do when we come across what well, seems like a great algorithm and we want to understand how great or how not great is it? Those are the real goals of this class. And so sorting is kind of a, um, it's a, the nice thing about sorting is that there's a lot of different well-known algorithms for it. Um, and a lot of them are useful in different situations. So there's a lot of interesting things for us to think about of how can you design these? What's the way of thinking to come up with these ideas? And then how do you compare them? Uh, so this is a little bit of an overview. We'll look at some slow sorting algorithms, then one much faster sorting algorithm called more merge sort. Um, and the important thing here is gonna be a new paradigm of like how to think of that idea. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll also introduce at the end of this unit a very important concept of a lower bound, meaning how can we prove that something is actually the best possible and you couldn't do um, much better. So that's what's on our agenda for this unit. And the sorting problem is here. You already know what sorting means. What I wanna point out here is that all we require is that the elements are comparable. What does that mean is that we can say which one is smaller or greater? Nothing more and nothing less. So in particular, we could use any of these algorithms to sort an array of strings or an array of students according to their grades in certain classes or something, or just an array of numbers as we'll usually think about. And so what's, what's important to emphasize here is that this is a very general model, right? We, we're, we're not necessarily going to assume that we can do any kind of special hashing or um, compare things numerically, but we just say that any, given any two elements, we can say which one is larger and which one is bigger. So that uh, has some limitations. It means that we might not be able to use some tricks that you can use uh, and, and which we'll actually talk about later in the class when you're able to make more assumptions about what you're sorting. But it means that these algorithms that we come up with are going to be applicable to any kind of data, anything that could be ordered, anything for which a sorting problem could make sense. We're going to be able to use these algorithms to solve it. This is a problem that is very important in computer science for a couple reasons. One is because it's actually important. It has a lot of applications. I think in some early history of computing, you can imagine problems like a large bank maybe has a bunch of records and they want to um, uh, take care of all their accounts at the end of the day to say, okay, these few transactions that occurred on these different accounts, let's actually sync that up with the balance and get that situated for the next day. And there's a story, maybe maybe apocryphal, but that at some point this um, sorting problem, because when you think about combining the information from the accounts at the end of the day, you have to sort so that you can combine like items, uh, that that was taking too much time that it was like from the close of business when they got all the records in from one day to opening the next day, there wasn't enough time to do it. They had to figure out a better way to do that sorting. And so I think that that set off some of the importance of this problem of, hey, we need to be able to come up with good ways to solve this. But beyond that um, practical application of sorting, it's also just very, it's, it's a great problem for us to think about different ways of thinking about algorithms because so many people have solved the sorting problem with very different kinds of algorithms that it's a good opportunity for us as uh, students of how to think of problem solving ideas to and analyze, okay, here's one way of solving the problem. Here's another one, here's another one. What are the ways that we would think of that? And um, what are the advantages and disadvantages? So that's what I want you to have in mind as we're going through this is not just, okay, there's another algorithm. I understand that. Some of the algorithms that we're gonna look at you've already seen before, such as selection sort. But don't think of it just as here's some recipes and now you have that in your like your recipe book 
what we should be thinking about is what are the underlying ideas here and how can we apply this to new problems besides such a well-studied one such as sorting. Okay, so first to start out, we're going to look at two sorting algorithms, selection sort and insertion sort. So here's the pseudocode. Well, actually, this is actual Python code for both of these. Um, and what you should notice, first of all, is that they both have two nested loops. So we have uh, two nested for loops here in selection sort and two nested uh, for and a while loop in insertion sort. And these are kind of similar, but they have some important differences. And so let's look at this. And as we're going through just some notation in, in case you're not familiar with Python, um, when we see this kind of thing, range of some blah up to blah, this means that I is going to get assigned to zero, then one, then two, and it goes up to the second bound minus one. So this is actually going to go up to the length of A, usually we call that N, minus two. See, because this range goes up to len A minus one. So this, um, you know, so just like a, a for loop, a standard for loop in C, where you would have like a strict less than for the upper bound, that's what you should think about for these ranges. Um, and similarly for this one here, this is going to start with like j equals i plus 1, then i plus 2, then going all the way up to n minus 1. Okay, so how does selection sort work? What selection sort is doing is it's at each step along the way, it's selecting the smallest thing out of uh, the rest of the array and then swapping it to the front. So if we uh, come up with some kind of toy example here for an input to selection sort. Okay, here's my randomly chosen input array that has size 10. And what does selection sort do? So it always has like the index i is looking at the next element to set. So initially i starts at zero. And then j is going to go through the remainder of the range, so starting with i plus one. And anytime um, it sees something smaller than the current smallest, then it's going to update this index m. So initially m points here. And every time we see something smaller, we're going to update m. So 2 is smaller than 31, so we update m. 23, and now nothing else is going to be smaller than 2. So after going through this whole loop for the inner loop, we'll end up swapping 2 and 31. So we swap these. Now this is 2 and 31 and everything else is the same. And at this point, after each step, that element, that um, element index i, is now the correct thing. So now this 2 is correct. We never have to look at that again. And we kind of repeat the process starting from the second element in the list. So now i is pointing to index 2. And m is also starting right here. And uh, but remember, sorry, it's, it's pointing to 31. And now we're going to find, OK, what's the next smaller thing? So we update m. OK, 23 is smaller, so we update that. 99 big, 38, blah, 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 27 big. But oh, 12 is smaller, so then we'll update m again. And then now that's the smallest thing of what's left. So we swap this index, um, index 1 with index m. So this 31 now will become. 12 and 12 will become 31. Now 2 and 12 are both in the right position and we update up with the next one. Um, and in this case the 23 would stay where it is because it has nothing else uh, is smaller than that out of what's left. So what's happening with selection sort is it's kind of always picking the next smallest thing out of the rest of the array and putting it in the next position. How is this different from insertion sort? Well, here's the same array. And what you'll notice is that there's some subtle differences with like the indexing. So here, i doesn't start at 0. i starts at 1, but it goes all the way up to n minus 1. And then j, the loop with j is a little bit different. It's not just always based on the indexes. It's going to start with j as 1 before i and keep going backwards as long as um, aj is bigger than aj plus 1. If you think about this, because we're trying to sort into increasing order, this means that like these two things are out of order. 
So insertion sort is trying to always put the beginning of the list back in order. So when we start out, the first element by itself, the reason why this i starts at 1 is because the first element itself, that's the sorted list. 31 by itself, if we forget about the rest of the list, 31 is sorted list, <laughs> just one thing. So what's going to happen is each time with insertion sort, you try to add in one more number and have that be part of the sorted list. So the next step through, which is really the first step of the algorithm, um, i is going to point to index 2. And then we're going to start with this j, like looking backwards and seeing how many times do we have to swap so that this whole part of the list, 31 and 2, becomes sorted. And so in this case, um, 31 and 2 are out of order. So we swap them, and you get 2 and 31. And that's good. And so now what do we know? It's not that 2 and 31 are absolutely what belongs here at the beginning of the array. It's just that for the numbers that they are, this part of the array is now sorted. There might be some smaller things later on, but this part of the array is in order. And so now when we, when we think about 23 at the next step through, then we compare this to what's behind us. So 23 versus 31, oh, 23 is smaller. So we swap those, 23 comes here, 31 goes there, and then we move backwards. So that's what this j equals j minus 1 does. So now we move backwards. We compare 2 and 23. That's in order. 2 is already smaller than 23, so there's nothing more to do. And now we have the first three elements of the list are in order. Next step, uh, I'll just do a couple more here. So the next step is with 99. Notice that when we try to incorporate 99, right away we compare. So we always comparing to like the thing behind it in the list, right? Because we have this part of the list. 2, 23, 31, which is already sorted. And now we're trying to throw in one more number. In this case, we get lucky. Why is that? Because 99 is already bigger than 31. So in this case, it doesn't have to do anything. 99 just gets compared to 31. We say, hey, it's already in order. Then I know the rest of the list is in order up to that point. So now my first four numbers are in order. So sometimes you have to do almost no work, like when you're incorporating 99 here. But then when we have, like in this next case for 38, that's going to have to get swapped with 99. 84 is going to have to get swapped with 99. 27 is going to have to get swapped with like a bunch of values to get all the way back to this index. So every time you come to the next number on the list, if it's a small one, you have to do a lot of work to put it back into the place where it belongs. If it's a big number that happens to be next, then you don't have to do any work. You can just kind of stay where it is. And so that's the idea of insertion sort. The difference between these, if you want to think about how they're working, selection sort is always starting by putting the absolute right number at the next position in the list. So it's looking through the whole thing and saying, what's the next thing that needs to go here? Whereas insertion sort is not really looking ahead. It's looking backwards. It's saying, I'm going to take the numbers that I have at the beginning, and I'm just going to try to keep putting them in order. Um, and so that, that difference um, seems to be like, kind of similar in terms of the uh, loops and everything, but it, it, it makes a, a bit of a difference in how these work and in the analysis. One of the things that's going to be useful in this class when we start to think about different algorithms, different ways of solving problems, is to try to take a, take a step back and saying, what's the similarity? What's the common like pattern um, or feature that's going on here? So for these two algorithms, we could think of them as just like separate ideas. Insertion sort is this thing. Selection sort is this thing. Let's, you know, let's analyze them separately and decide what they are. But it can be useful for helping our thought process of coming up with new ideas to say, what's the common feature here? And I would say both of these kind of work in two phases. There's like pick and place. So pick is how do you choose the next element that you're going to worry about, and place is you, you put it into the position where it goes, right? So what's the way to think about this in terms of pick and place? Well, for selection sort, the picking is hard because we're picking the perfect number to put in the next one. We're looking through the whole array and saying, what's the smallest one that would come next? Um, and so that pick operation is kind of slow. We have to look through the rest of the list. But then once, once we have it, we know exactly where to put it. We put it exactly in the next spot, 
and we don't have to move it around a whole bunch. Um, so this is still like up to a big O of n time for picking, but for placing, it's just one swap. And then as you can probably guess, in insertion sort, it's the opposite. So for insertion sort, how do we pick the next number in insertion sort, the next number to worry about at every step? It's just the next number in the list. You know, at this point in the, in the insertion sort, the next thing we're going to worry about is 38. Not because of anything special about 38, just because it's next. So the picking is like trivial. Um, no work at all. It's just the next index. But placing it is hard because with insertion sort, we don't know exactly where like that 38 is going to go since we didn't do anything special to pick it. So for placing, that's when you have to do a whole bunch of comparisons and keep swapping backwards till it kind of finds the place where it belongs. So this placement in insertion sort is kind of the slow aspect up to big O of n. And the reason why I like to think of these things this way is that this happens a lot of times in algorithms where we have different phases or different um, parts of what's, what's going on. And we can compare them by saying, oh, okay, this one kind of optimizes this aspect to be fast, but then as a consequence, this other thing becomes slow. And then that can help us think about how to improve them or why we would like one over the other. Okay, so let's analyze these. What we want to do as usual is think about, a, we want a big theta bound on the worst case running time. Always that's our going to be our standard goal. Worst case running time, because we're trying to think about like, well, let's be pessimistic about what the input might look like since we don't know. And then big theta because we want a tight analysis of that worst case running time. For both of these, we can get a very big big of, o n square, big o of n squared running time because you have two loops. Each one has goes at most n times. That's true for selection sort and true for insertion sort. So anytime you have two nested big O of n loops, the total cost is going to be big O of n squared. But the question is, is that an overcount? So big when with the big theta bound, what we're asking is like, is big O of n squared um, an overestimate or not? There's a couple different ways to think about this. And I'm, so I'm going to show you two ways of thinking about this with selection sort. Um, the two ways that we can think about analyzing this have advantages and disadvantages they might make more sense to you or not. And so that's why I want to try to um, show both ways of thinking about it. And then when you come across a new problem, you can have that flexibility in your back pocket. So one way of thinking about this is we have a big O of n squared. Now, if we can match that with a lower bound of big omega of n squared, then we're, we're going to get it. And so what's going on with, let's, let's go back to selection sort and think about it. Um, we have these nested loops. This outer loop definitely goes n minus one times. No question about that. But the issue is that the inner loop, the number of times this runs depends on i, right? So the number of times this goes is like n minus i minus one, if you count it out. Like the first time through, it's n minus one from one up to n minus one, so that's n minus one things, and you, you, this inner loop becomes one less each time. Why does that make sense? Is because the inner loop is kind of finding the smallest thing from the rest of the list, and that rest of the list, the unsorted part, is getting smaller every step. Um, and now we have two things, but, th but the inner one depends on i, depends on the outer index. And what that means is that you can't just like multiply these naively because you have to think about how this i changes. So let's think about what that is as we add it up. The first time through, it's n minus 1. Then it's uh, n minus 2, because for that second phase, we have two things. Um, and we're looking through the rest, n minus 2. And then this is how the summation is going to go, n minus 3, n minus 4. All the way down to the last step is only going to be one thing that we have to look through. And so this is the, the summation that we're trying to think about what it is. And that's going to tell us how many times um, this inner for loop gets executed. In this case, it's a very simple, like standard 
arithmetic summation. So you can probably you probably already know what this is going to be. But I want to sh just show you two ways of thinking about this kind of a summation. So let's go back to this slide. Um, we can think about this pictorially. So we have, if we think about these as bars, the first one is n minus 1, then n minus 2. I hope you can hear my cat. Then n minus 3, n minus 4, n minus 5, all the way down to the last little pile is just one. So I'm not very good at drawing, but imagine that these are all the same width and they're getting kind of one shorter every time. Well, I said that one way of, of getting this to be a tight bound is matching it with the big omega. So if you don't like to think about summations, one trick that works a lot of the times is to just carve out a big enough piece out of this puzzle that I know is going to be big enough. Um, so one strategy is, I'll say like the big omega strategy, is I'm going to have a matching lower bound with a smaller constant. So I want some kind of um, matching something times n squared with smaller uh, constant there. Okay, so what is this strategy is I can think about half of the time. So when, when is this the most expensive? That's what we're trying to think for a lower bound. Well, the most expensive iterations for selection sort are the first ones. So we can say that we have at least n over 2 iterations of the outer loop when the inner loop is more than n over 2. Right, so that that's kind of what I've drawn in this box here, saying that the most the mo the most expensive half of the outer loop has the inner loop always being at least n over two, and so what then now we can multiply those to say that the cost is at least the product of those two, which is n over two times n over two, uh, which is one fourth times n squared, and notice that's a constant times n squared. So that's big omega of n squared. And now we're done. Because we already knew it was big O of n squared just by saying each loop has at most n iterations. You can think of this big O of n squared as being kind of like considering the whole big box, which would contain everything here. So what we've said is that this big fuchsia box is n squared. This, and that covers everything that the algorithm does plus more. So it's an overestimate. The red box is n squared over 4. And that only covers things that the algorithm does, but misses some. So it's an underestimate. And when we have an overestimate and an underestimate, which have the same asymptotics, like both n squared in this case, that means that we have a big theta. So from this, we can conclude that selection sort is big theta of n squared, which is what we want. To, to understand. So it's really a, that's why we call it quadratic time because it's n squared. Uh, and another way of doing this, this is kind of the precise way. So this was the imprecise, like getting an overbound estimate and an underbound estimate, and then they match up. The math is easier because all the most math that we had to do is multiply n over 2 times n over 2. But the logic of it is a little bit more tricky. So this is like we have to think more creatively in probably the logic of how to do it. But then the actual mathematics is, is even super easy. The other way is that you have to do a little bit harder like math arithmetic stuff, but it's, um, it doesn't require as many leaps of logic. And so this is just kind of just do the summation. Um, so this ends up being exactly the summation that we care about when you think about the cost of each iteration through um, selection sort. And it comes up with this formula. This is n times n minus 1 over 2. We can rewrite that as 1 half n squared minus 1 half times n. So the 1 half n squared dominates, and that's when we know that it's big uh, theta of n squared. So for this one, you don't have to do an upper bound and a lower bound because we're counting exactly how much it is. So not as much of a logical like trick, oh, let's think about you know how we could carve out a big piece and a small piece, make sure we don't overestimate too much. 
Nope, you just say exactly how many iterations that is. But we have to know a little bit about summations, and this should be a review from um, like your discrete math class, how to do with this arithmetic series summation. We'll get more practice about this as time goes on. Uh, and at this point, I would say that you should be able to use both of these methods to be able to think about selection sort. And that's where we're going to leave it today. I want you to think about what would be um, more difficult, slightly more difficult about analyzing insertion sort. And that's where we'll start for the next video.